Hello, friends. Welcome to the National Constitution Center and to today's convening of America's Town Hall. I'm Jeffrey Rosen, the president and CEO of this wonderful institution. Let us inspire ourselves for the learning ahead by reciting together the National Constitution Center's mission statement. Here we go. The National Constitution Center is the only institution in America chartered by Congress to increase awareness and understanding of the U.S. Constitution among the American people on a nonpartisan basis. I want to uh, plug some of the great upcoming programs for our fall season on November 22nd. We're talking about presidential power uh, as part of our uh, great partnership with the SNF Agora Institute. On November 30th, we will uh, do a deep dive into Lincoln's constitutional legacy with three great writers about Lincoln who have new books out on the topic. On December 8th, we'll talk about poetry in the Constitution. Oh, this will be so exciting, um, including the influence of poets like Mercy Otis Warren, John Milton, and Phyllis Wheatley. And on December 15th, Bill of Rights Day, we'll talk about the meaning of equality throughout American history with three phenomenal scholars as well. So much learning and light ahead. Uh, I'll, we'll take your questions throughout the program today, so please put them in the Q&A box. And I would like to thank TD Bank for their generous support in making today's program possible. And now it is a great pleasure to introduce our very distinguished panel. Maggie Blackhawk is professor of law at NYU and an award-winning interdisciplinary scholar and teacher of constitutional law, federal Indian law, and legislation. Her uh, first book project uh, highlights the centrality of native nations, native peoples, and American colonialism to the constitutional law and constitutional history of the United States, the manuscript builds on her Harvard Law Review article called Federal Indian Law as Paradigm Within Public Law. Gregory Dowd is Helen Hornbeck Tanner, collegiate professor in the Department of American Culture at the University of Michigan. His publications include Groundless, Rumors, Legends, and Hoaxes on the Early American Frontier, and War Under Heaven, Pontiac, the Indian Nations, and the British Empire. Woody Holton is Mc. Costland Professor of History at the University of South Carolina. He's the author of several acclaimed books, including Abigail Adams, which won the Bancroft Prize, Unruly Americans and the Origins of the Constitution, and Forced Founders, Indians, Debtors, Slaves, and the Making of the American Revolution in Virginia. His most recent book is Liberty is Sweet, The Hidden History of the American Revolution. And Donald Grindy is Professor in the Department of Africana and American Studies at the University of Buffalo. He has written extensively on the subject and his books include The Iroquois and the Founding of the American Nation and Exemplar of Liberty, Native America and the Evolution of Democracy. It's such an honor to have you dream team of scholars, Maggie Blackhawk, Gregory Dowd, Woody Holton and Donald Grindy. Our goal in our precious hour together is for you to teach us to, to spread learning and light about the influence not only of uh, Native American agency, but also of colonialism and Western expansion on the founding of the Constitution and on American constitutional development. So Maggie Blackhawk, I'll uh, begin with you. Give us uh, an overview about the influence of colonialism and Western expansion on the founding of the Constitution. Thank you so much for having me and uh, for focusing on a topic that I think needs much more attention, which is not only the influence of um, Native people on the constitutional framework that we have now, but also American colonialism. Uh, and so with respect to the Constitution and the founding, um, at the time the Constitution uh, began uh, being drafted, it was uh, broadly believed that the current governing document, the Articles of Confederation had failed in a very particular way, which is it had failed to resolve the issue of how to um, acquire and uh, distribute lands along the Western Front. And so part of the revolution, of course, was a deep concern on the part of the colonists that Britain was going to keep them from uh, taking the largesse of the, what was the American West and the Ohio River Valley. And the Articles of Confederation essentially split the baby and tried to make everyone happy uh, by allowing both the state governments and uh, a very weak national government the ability to acquire land simultaneously. 
And so uh, land was often uh, seen as at the heart of how the new uh, constitutional framework needed to be formed. And the view was that a stronger national government would be able to more uh, methodologically and more economically uh, be able to acquire those lands in the West without provoking very expensive wars with uh, very formidable native people who lived on those lands and believed quite rightly that through treaty as well as through uh, long time historical possession that those lands were their homelands. And so the constitution, its structure was in many ways an effort to take the treaty power, for example, solidly away from the states. And that was um, actually, if you look at the work of very recent work of Mary Sarah Builder, there, there were native delegates that went to the convention and lobbied for a stronger national treaty power. Um, and so you have a treaty clause that made very clear that the states could not form treaties and that the national government would take the lead in, in large part to be able to uh, acquire those lands. And so you end up with a stronger executive, um, a stronger vision of a military force, um, as well as uh, the ability of Congress to take over territories, manage those territories, and to set laws for them in order to give structure to Western expansion, which everyone expected, but no one really had a sense of what form it would take. They knew it would go one direction or the other, whether it was going to be violent militaristic dispossession or a diplomatic treaty-based um, negotiation, but Western expansion was really at the heart of debates around the founding and a, and a need for a stronger national government that the constitution structured. And so both American colonialism and native agency uh, were at the heart of the drafting and passing of that document. Thank you so much for that fascinating uh, explication of how colonialism uh, and Western expansion influenced things from the treaty power to the nature of the executive. Uh, a, 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 a wonderful introduction to the topic. Gregory Dowd, you have argued against the commonly held belief that the American Revolution intensified the danger of colonialism posed to Native Americans. And instead, you've argued that the American Constitution granted Native Americans some sovereignty while the British Constitution did not. Tell us more about that argument and how the Native American experience and agency influenced the American founding. Yeah, I'd be happy to do that. I, I, and, and interestingly enough, I can do that without disagreeing with anything Maggie has said. I, I entirely support every, everything she said. Um, the, what, and, and the way I would put it is that Native Americans have been able to seize from the Constitution uh, a, a, an interpretation, a powerful interpretation, and a still powerful and, and working interpretation of, uh, of sovereignty, um, which is not really possible in a um, British colonial situation or a, less possible in a Commonwealth situation. In brief, under the crown, and I, I do not see the crown as a friend of Native Americans, and I, I, I don't think that uh, uh, indigenous peoples necessarily in uh, co former British colonies see the crown as a friend of Native Americans. Um, or indigenous peoples, uh, the crown, crown sovereignty, crown sovereignty embodied in parliament in a uh, modern system uh, is unitary. And really there's not much of an opportunity for indigenous peoples to claim, to, to register, to assert their pre-existing sovereignty. But in the US system, uh, because peculiarly we, allow for the division of sovereignty. We allow for um, pre-existing sovereignty, sovereignties of the states, sovereignty of the uh, in indigenous peoples, sovereignty of the federal government, you know, of the, of the, of the people as a whole, the, the national people as a whole. These three existing sovereignties still, still exist. And, you know, I'm not arguing that the situation is better for indigenous people in the United States. Um, indigenous people in Canada, in New Zealand, in Australia have managed to uh, assert in their own ways uh, their, uh, their independence and autonomy. But in the US, we have this system in which the pre-existing sovereignty, the ancient sovereignty is still acknowledged. 
Granted, it's under a great deal of congressional sufferance, but Congress has not taken it away. Um, and if the, the uh, Congress is not likely to, um, because indigenous peoples have been able to assert their power and their authority and to retain these elements. But I, I do not disagree that, um, that Western expansion was a potent force um, driving the American Revolution. I do not uh, disagree that what, but, but it would have happened anyway. I mean, in other words, under the British, there was considerable Western expansion um, and uh, it happened elsewhere in the British empire that the same kind of expansion over indigenous peoples happened elsewhere in the British empire where there was no American Revolution. So I, I, I would argue that um, there, there's this, what we should attend to is the way in which American republicanism and the peculiar dimensions of American federalism opened up a space that indigenous peoples, especially in the second half of the 20th century to our own time have grabbed and uh, really asserted in, in very important ways. Thank you so much for that. Uh, and for that fascinating uh, contrast of the American and the British uh, experience. Uh, Donald Grindy, you have argued uh, with Bruce jo Johansson that the Iroquois Grand Council had 50 members and that Benjamin Franklin's 1754 Albany plan um, was influenced by it. And you've noted other influences of the Iroquois constitution on the US constitution and of Native American impact on the development of the constitution more generally, including the first words of the constitution, we the people, separation of powers and basic procedures. Tell us more about the influence of Native American constitutionalism on the American constitution. Well, you have to realize that Native Americans at key times are invited to, uh, particularly the, the Iroquois or Haudenosaunee people. Uh, at the Albany Plan of Union, they were there, uh, and Franklin was there, and they proposed this uh, you know, union, uh, and it's not just me that argues that the Iroquois influenced uh, the editor of Thomas Jefferson's papers, <laughs> who was a mentor of mine, also points that out. Uh, and um, then, of course, uh, the um, Articles of Confederation incorporate almost verbatim seven or eight articles of the Albany Plan of Union. Uh, other times when there's Iroquois influence, uh, although Ronald Reagan has denied, I don't know if that's been reversed now, but at, at the time of the Declaration of Independence, the Iroquois chiefs were invited to Philadelphia and they were, the chiefs were in the top floor and the other members that came were on the uh, lawn outside while the Declaration of Independence was debated and declared. Then um, another thing you, ne you need to, to realize here is that Benjamin Franklin became the equivalent of a multi-billionaire primarily for printing Indian treaties. He made a hell of a lot of money on it. And uh, so he knew that uh, because they were best sellers, that uh, white people uh, were interested in the way Indians did things and their views and so on. And, uh, you know, it's not just him, but James Madison, who was sympathetic to some things, but he objected to others. He said that the Iroquois government was a government of skirts, which is his way of talking about the power of, of women. But um, at the Constitutional Convention, uh, John Adams's defense uh, was uh, the handbook that they used. Uh, it was passed out to every delegate walking into the Constitutional Convention. And there, and, when, and Adams was commissioned to do that because Harvard had the best library. And, <laughs> He was to develop a compendium of government analysis around the world. And in that is the Iroquois 
uh, government and several other native governments and so on. And Adams points out that the separation of powers in that uh, in the Iroquois government is uh, uh, one of the best examples. Uh, Thomas Jefferson uh, talked about how Indian government, uh, the only government that has less powers than the American government is Indian nations. Um, so um, the, the, the major influences at the Constitutional Convention are we the people, uh, the idea of vesting sovereignty in the people, see. The British government vested sovereignty in the monarch, and God gave that to the monarch, and the monarch passed it on to Parliament, you see. Uh, so many people pointed out that uh, although God didn't give Indians uh, power, they did pretty well with their government, you see. And so that was one. But some people wanted to make Washington a monarch, and some bishop crown him and so that God granted you know power to the government but we the people is sovereignty rests in the people another area is federalism which is really important uh, the Iroquois have that the six nations and so on uh, and this is important that people don't often uh, misunderstand you got Puritans in the north Quakers in Pennsylvania, Catholics in Maryland, and Church of England or Episcopalians in the South. And they all are fleeing uh, England and they don't like it and they all have some trouble getting along with each other. But the Iroquois provided a thing where people with different languages and so on, uh, the Tuscarora, the Oneidas and so on can still get along see, even amongst their differences. And another thing that's important is that the government stretches from New Hampshire to Georgia, see. And uh, in the past, uh, a government with that size was almost always an empire, see. And uh, that meant some kind of top-down autocracy and so on. And this promise not to do that, so that was a way of uh, uh, union as well. Uh, and so uh, we the people, sovereignty and the people, separation of powers uh, is the next one, uh, in addition to federalism. Uh, and again, Adams and others point out that the separation of powers is distinct in uh, Native American, especially Iroquois, see that, you know, war and diplomacy is the national government's role and you get down to the local government, divorce and child custody is in the community and, and points in between, see, with regards to that. So that states could uh, say they still had some power, see, they weren't just giving it all up in this process. So this is really, really important. And, uh, and, uh, and Native Americans provide the alternative to the British uh, way of doing things. So two things I think is important to point out here. At the time of the American Revolution, that, and it still is the bloodiest war in American history, the British killed 1% of all Americans. So, so the founding fathers know an appeal to the British form of government is not going to be very popular because, and remember also, loyalists were shipped off to Nova Scotia. <laughs> so there's this strong anti-British sentiment uh, that's there. And so an alternative to the British system is really politically popular, see, in terms of, of this. Another thing that I counter people that argue that we basically got a system from the British, I says, have you ever seen the American constitution alongside of the British constitution? <laughs> and of course they say, no, uh, you, you don't realize that the British constitution is simply 
the sum total of all the laws enacted since Magna Carta. Uh, there is no Article One, Section Two, and so on and so forth. Sitting here, so I think those are important things that uh, uh, we need to be conscious of in the development of American government that are distinctive, uh, and also how it plays into the politics uh, and uh, uh, that kind of thing. Thank you so much for all that. Thank you for calling our attention to the connection between Iroquois thought and John Adams's defense on the Constitution, and we'll look forward to exploring those connections uh, further. Uh, Woody Holton, in Force Founders and in your latest book, Liberty is Sweet, you argue, as your colleagues have suggested as well, that the rise of the Native American coalition and the prevention of the United States from expanding West and seizing Indian lands was one of the primary crises that produced the ratification and creation of the Constitution and the inability of Congress to survey and secure Western lands made them unable to realize their plan to deal with the massive federal war debt. And you, and you focus in particular on the experience in Georgia and Virginia, which is very illuminating. Tell us more about that central argument of your important books. Uh, well, thanks for the question. And that takes us back to the origins, not of the Constitution, which I'll get to quickly, but to the origins of the revolution. Um, as everybody on the panel knows, and many people watching also know, the British in 1763 tried, and I'll uh, emphasize the word tried, to draw a line along the crest of the Appalachian Mountains and say, you cannot go west of this line. Now, they didn't build a Great Wall of China there, so actual settlers could go west uh, of that line and did, but in the same way that you or I, if you wanna sell your car, you gotta have a piece of paper. You gotta have the title. I can't just walk up to somebody downtown and sell them my car. I gotta sign the title over, the, over to them. And this is where the proclamation line of 1763 was effective in that land speculators couldn't get title to land west of the line. And I've been into the archives and seen patent issued, patent issued, patent issued, and then suddenly no patents issued. And that's because it took a long time in Virginia, the largest of the North American colonies for it to actually uh, take effect. But once it did, uh, that shut down the business of getting title to Western land. Again, it doesn't stop actual settlers from getting out there, but in a sense that makes it worse for speculators because that means settlers who they had intended to sell land to are now able to go west, swipe land from Indians and not have to pay somebody like George Washington or Thomas Jefferson for it. And of course, Washington uh, said that um, I mean, Washington, the greatest estates we have in this colony were made by taking up the rich back lands. And Jefferson denied after the revolution being involved in land speculation, but I found seven different land speculation firms that he was involved in before the revolution. They saw that as the way to wealth and the proclamation line shut that down and it would still be shut down today. It's hard to imagine if the British had remained and had kept to that policy. And in fact, Greg knows this better than me and can talk about it when, when we come back to him, but they still quote the proclamation of 1763 in Canadian law uh, today. So uh, there's one way in which Native Americans helped bring on the revolution, uh, not talking about the constitution yet, but the revolution. And I have to mention another one I just discovered while researching the latest book, and that is the Native American impact on the Stamp Act. You know, that's the one law, if you know one law that led to the revolution, you know, oh yeah, taxation without representation, the Stamp Act. I finally got around to reading it and it says where the money goes. The money goes to fund 10,000 troops, British troops that will be left in North America, some in the Caribbean, some in Canada, but the bulk on the border between the colonists in places like Pennsylvania, where you are, South Carolina, uh, where I am, between the colonists and the indigenous people west of them. And they are there to prevent the natives from attacking the colonists, but they're also there to prevent the colonists from attacking the indigenous people, not because the British government had suddenly 
become enlightened and realize these are human beings who we, whose land we shouldn't steal, none of that, but because the most expensive thing governments did then as now was go to war. And so the British government essentially put those British troops out there as peacekeeping troops to keep both sides from starting a war against the other side that the British army would have to come in and finish it. So I like to say that the British government put a human wall of troops on the Western border and then thought it was quite reasonable to make the colonists pay for it. And that's the Stamp Act. And so I think they had Native Americans had a huge impact on the origins of war. And then throughout the war, I was struck by how many references there are in the, in the military history of the war both loyalists and, um, and patriots, but not so much British troops, going into battle and giving the war hoop. Uh, I think people reading it in my book will be bored. Uh, they'll see it so many times. And of course, he gave the Indian war hoop uh, as they attacked, whether it's George Rogers Clark uh, out, Vincent, out at Vincennes or, or loyalist soldiers here in South Carolina. Um, now, they thought they were copying Indians and giving the, the war hoop. I think it's probably the roots of the rebel yell from that later war as well. But it goes to an issue that Professor Blackhawk mentioned, and that is colonialism, that this copying of Indians is part of the colonial project. Uh, I think it's kind of cool to see that natives had such an impact on them, but uh, people use the term cultural appropriation now uh, and I think it's appropriate for that as well. And a classic example of that would be the Boston Tea Party. Those guys dressed as so-called Mohawks, not because they actually thought they were gonna convince anybody that Mohawk Indians had crossed all the way from upstate New York all the way across Massachusetts to Boston, but because Mohawks were, for the guys who dumped those 342 chests of tea, into Boston Harbor, Mohawks and other Native Americans were, and I think you said it wonderfully in your book, uh, Professor Grindy, exemplars of liberty. They stood for strength in the colonial mind and they stood for liberty. And so I think there's all these influences in the origins of the revolution, in the war itself, which by the way, I think it's fair to say the natives won the war in the West. Lots of historians say that. And I really became more persuaded of that researching this because what's the number one objective of the Americans in the West? New York. They never captured New York City after the British took it in September 1776. The Americans never took it back. They still won the war. What's their big objective in the West? Detroit. And I found about a dozen plans to capture Detroit because that's the great armory where the British are handing out guns and even more importantly, ammunition to their indigenous allies. And so in the, in the letter where he quote unquote coined the term actually stolen from a, a lady in Philadelphia, Jeff, but where he supposedly coined the term empire of liberty, Jefferson wrote that letter in December of 1780, we're gonna establish an empire of liberty. And that specifically was a letter telling George Rogers Clark, we can't do any of that until we capture Detroit and thereby disarm our indigenous opponents. So I'm, I've talked too long, so I'm gonna stop and get back to the constitution later, but, but I'll just lay a little bit of groundwork that native people had influenced the origins of the war and the war itself as well. All fascinating. Thank you so much for that um, and uh, uh, for teaching us so well. Uh, Professor Blackhawk, I'm gonna ask you a big question, which is to give us a sort of constitution 101 of the most important uh, Supreme Court cases uh, grappling with the question of uh, colonialism and the Constitution. Uh, in your pathbreaking uh, article, Federal Indian Law is a Paradigm Within Public Law, you note that famous cases like Creek Nason versus Georgia and Worcester versus Georgia forced the court to grapple with the power of colonialism in the Constitution. You also note the important case of Elk versus Wilkins, where the court blessed Nebraska's refusal to allow a Native American to vote because he wasn't subject to the jurisdiction thereof as required by the 14th Amendment. And in a recent New York Times piece, you uh, note uh, what you call the Dred Scott of federal Indian law, the United States versus Rogers in 1846, uh, drafted by the infamous Chief Justice Taney, which established the plenary powers doctrine where the United States could wield power over the unfortunate race of Native Americans 
without constitutional limit. I know that there's a lot there, but it's so important to, to teach our audience about those landmark cases, give us a sense of what was going on in them and, and what the court held and what their significance was. So thank you so much for those. I think um, bringing uh, the history of Native peoples as well as American colonialism into the study of the Constitution expands our constitutional theory and constitutional history in two large ways. So the first is that it expands our vision of the Constitution and who makes constitutional law well beyond the court. And if you look at the long 19th century, the majority of constitutional law was really made by Congress and the executive. The court did little to review during that period. And so if you wanna understand the constitution, you really need to look well beyond the courts and Supreme Court decisions to, to understand how that constitutional framework was made. So American federalism, for example, is the easiest example to say, look, the, the formation of a strong national government was reinforced by the, the Supreme Court um, and Chief Justice John Marshall in those uh, Marshall Trilogy cases that established federal power over the uh, any dispute over Indian lands, taking squarely that power away from the states and, and placing it within the national government. However, the building up of the strength of the national government was really an executive and congressional project in the West. Um, whom Richard White, uh, Richard White describes uh, as the kindergarten of the American state, where the form of the national government took modern forms by allowing the national government to not just make court cases, the court actually just ran away from uh, the executive and the Congress when, because it has no army and no power. Um, but the Congress and the executive really got its sea legs in governing all the way down to the local. And so if you look beyond that, we start to understand that the Constitution is so much more than the Supreme Court. And that continues on in the context of federal Indian law and uh, the expansion of uh, another doctrine that I think is central and important to highlight, which is the plenary power doctrine, which Chief Justice Taney really brought and, and domesticated in U.S. v. Rogers, the case that you described, that that doctrine not only allowed um, and gave the federal government license to begin the reservation era, which was an era in which the national government essentially built the tension camps on reservation lands where native people couldn't even leave without getting a pass from a federal agent. And the federal government ran courts and schools and hospitals. Uh, in ways that subordinated Native people and split up Native families. And that was um, essentially a doctrine that Justice Taney captured from international law and brought into U.S. constitutional law that said the national political branches had extra constitutional power. So it arose not from an enumerated source, but from outside the Constitution, and so thus was not limited by any constitutional limit including judicial review. So the court's supposed to back away from it. And that doctrine, the plenary power doctrine is still very much good law. Not only was it used during the reservation era, but over the long 20th and 21st century, it's been expanded to add machinery to all sorts of areas of constitutional law. So the other way that understanding native history and American colonialism shapes, reshapes our vision of American constitutional law is that it it changes the canon to be able to understand why immigration law and foreign affairs and governance of the territories really should be central to our understanding of what constitutional law is. So when we have conversations about good governance, it shouldn't just be reconstruction amendments and the original failure of, of human enslavement and that progress narrative. We need to also talk about American colonialism and a doctrine that's still alive that in the 20th century has been used um, as the foundation for our immigration law for foreign affairs um, and to, to fuel all sorts of forms of militarism under executive power. And it actually has been used even most recently in Hawaii v. Trump to uphold the, the travel ban. So this is not a doctrine that has gone away. This is the doctrine that also underlied Korematsu and the detention of Japanese Americans after World War II. Two of those camps were actually on Indian reservation. So the same detention machinery that was used in the late 19th century was used to detain Japanese Americans in the 20th century. The same machinery to use to house immigrant families intergenerationally was 
used to detain Native people in the so-called Indian Wars in the, of the 19th century and to, to actually detain families intergenerationally as so-called war criminals, including children. And so that if we look at the constitution through that lens, we actually start to see an entirely different constitutional narrative form. One that doesn't have that same progressive thrust to it in one way, but it does also have the vision of the recognition of inherent tribal sovereignty that Professor Dowd described that is exceptional to North America. So in, in addition to having our Dred Scott, there's also essentially a, a Brown v. Board of looking at this other form of, of constitutional narrative, this other history. And that is the recognition of inherent tribal sovereignty, which is exceptional to the constitutional power of the United States. It's, it's part of the recognition power. And unlike Canada or New Zealand or Australia, these Commonwealth countries that we think are so progressive on native issues, the United States is, is alone in having this incredible framework of federal Indian law that is deeply flawed and imperfect, but it is at the forefront of the mitigation of American colonialism as another constitutional failure. So we get both the dark story and the positive story, but neither of which have been explored in any depth because our canon just leaves all of these areas out. Thank you so much for that. So fascinating describing the influence of the plenary powers doctrine on current uh, questions like the travel ban case and on Korematsu. And just as you showed us the influence of the Native American agency and colonialism on the development of executive power and the constitution itself, so you really have are changing the way we think about its influence on the development of constitutional law. Professor Dowd, um, you also have played such an important role, as Professor Blackhawk said, in helping us understand uh, recognition of Native American sovereignty. And in your article, Indigenous Peoples Without a Republic, you conclude that in the American context, Indians achieved through organizing violence and litigation, a slippery but important variety of sovereignty, making claims on the peculiarities of American republicanism and federalism. And you talk about leading Supreme Court cases from uh, Johnson and Mintosh to the ones that Professor Blackhawk has just been discussing, the uh, the, the Marshall Court, uh, uh, Cherokee Nation, and Western Georgia, Georgia cases um, to help us understand how this notion of native sovereignty was developed. So tell us more about what the idea is, how the Supreme Court recognized it, and what its strengths and limitations are. So it is, it is central, really, to a lot of um, the activities of federal uh, federally recognized uh, Native American uh, nations today. Um, the, notion, the notion of sovereignty, I, I would argue, and I argued in War Under Heaven, has indigenous analogs. Um, the Western notion of sovereignty has indigenous analogs that uh, one finds in statements um, made by uh, leaders confronting colonialism in the middle of the 18th century. I mean, Minwewe, an Ojibwa leader confronting um, uh, British colonizers said quite simply, God gave us this country. <laughs> and in a way that is a, that is a statement of sovereignty. It is, um, we have inherent uh, possession, we have inherent powers um, and uh, they, they do not derive from you, uh, we have them. And, and that, um, I, you know, I would not argue that the framers had that necessarily in mind themselves, but I would argue that they set up a republic um, in which it is possible to have sovereignty emanate from several sources, from the people of the nation as a whole, from the people of the states, and as indigenous peoples have come to insist uh, from their tribal nations. And uh, so Native Americans, were, I would say, though, on the minds of the founders and um, on the minds of the founders in, in some of the ways uh, Maggie and Woody have pointed to, especially as well as Don, that um, we that they they were uh, both um, exemplars of liberty, but at the same time, they were a challenge. Um, they were formidable, as Maggie said. They're, um, um, 
their powers were uh, militarily formidable. North of the Ohio River, there was a Confederacy organizing that was defeating American uh, forces regularly. Um, Georgia was confronting a powerful Muscogee nation. And if you look at the Constitution, it's fascinating to me that there are Native Americans are mentioned. Only three other people are mentioned. We the people, people of the states, and foreign powers. That's it. Um, enslaved people are buried under an, you know that amazing uh, proliferation of words in the three fifths clause. Um, the um, whereas in that same clause, Indians not taxed appear. They're named. Indians without the jurisdiction of uh, the states are named. Um, so Native Americans clearly on the minds of the founders um, as a challenge. Um, and, uh, you know, this is, and I, I agree that this is why um, the treaty making power was sent, put, put into the central government, the commerce powers of regulating commerce with Indian tribes restricted to the federal government um, in many ways mimicking uh, the efforts of the British in the 1760s of trying to, uh, to centralize control of indigenous policy and take it away from the colonies in the 1760s. The federal government does that effectively uh, under the constitution, but in a system, a Republican system that is based on popular sovereignty, that is based on sovereignty that emanates from the people, people of the states, people of the nation as a whole, and also as indigenous peoples have come to assert and to claim and to get um, the people of the uh, tribal nations. If you look at, Supreme, at, at cases throughout the Supreme Court, many of them, uh, you know, right up to McGirt, uh, the recent, more, one of the more recent uh, celebrated cases, um, which has a Janus face, I think. I mean, it's, it's th this, this recent case out of Oklahoma has a, um, a dimension that very much enforces or, or, or reinforces tribal sovereignty. But at the same time, there's this sense Congress has not ended the reservation. Implicitly, Congress can act. Implicitly, that plenary power that uh, Maggie refers to is still a sort of Damocles possibly hanging over. It's possibly there. But I suspect the strength of indigenous peoples, the continuing strength will continue to resist this. So we have a, we, we, we you know, it, is, it isn't a neat picture. It's a very messy picture, but, um, but, but there is that, that, that tension remains. Thank you very much for that. Thanks for calling attention to the uh, ambiguous status of the McGirt uh, case, and also for really helping us uh, understand how debates about sovereignty, which were so central at the time of the framing, uh, for the framers themselves, were influenced by conceptions of Native American sovereignty. Uh, Donald Grindy, before uh, the panel started, we were talking about James Wilson's original draft of the Constitution, which we I have the honor of displaying at the Constitution Center, thanks to the Pennsylvania Historical Society, which owns the draft. And you said that Wilson's draft and Wilson's footnotes show some influence of Native American uh, experience and thinking. Tell us more about that and of other influences of the Native American experience and agency on American constitutional development. Well, um, you know, the, the um, Wilson's uh, draft uh, was ignored, well, couldn't, was not seen by constitutional scholars for 125 years because Madison said that everything should be destroyed, but James Wilson could not destroy the first draft that was at his committee meetings in August of 1787. And so it remained in the family until the early 20th century. And then descendants, uh, the grandchildren or whatever of James Wilson gave that, that to the Historical Society of Pennsylvania. And that's when it emerges into constitutional law. Uh, 
And uh, so that's an important thing to understand about uh, all of this is that Madison wanted everybody just to look at his book on the Constitution. Uh, but this is an alternative and it shows more influence by Native people. And it also shows directly how they use Locke and Rousseau and, and, uh, and others in that. It's really funny because when I was doing my initial research in the 1980s, just before the bicentennial of the Constitution, I went to the Historical Society of Pennsylvania and checked out the draft. Uh, actually, they wouldn't, they said initially they wouldn't let me look at it, that they had a Xerox of it. And it's four, four foot by six foot, you know? So I said, no, I must look at the original. And so they brought it out, uh, put it on the table, and two guys on either side of the table kind of turned it and stuff so I could see it. Uh, and um, the, the lady who was the head of the thing, before I finally did that, she put her hands on her hip and said, Professor Grindy, you realize you're requesting to see the original document, uh, the original first draft of the Constitution? I said, yes, you know. So um, I think it's important to understand that, but it's also important to connect with some of the other uh, panelists here that uh, Native Americans also exert a very strong economic bond here. When you talk about the frontier and the British wanting to draw the proclamation line, part of that is revenue for the fur trade. A chief source of revenue is the fur trade for the British to maintain the army and so on. See? And the British don't get any money for people that go to Western Pennsylvania or into Kentucky uh, and set up a farm. <laughs> uh, the revenue comes from trade with Indians. And that's a big deal. See, Then it changes with the founding of the American nation. Uh, and uh, it's important to understand that the first 30 or 40 years, the federal government was funded by Indian land. What are they doing? They are buying through treaties, Indian land in Ohio, Kentucky, and other places for two or three cents an acre. Then they're turning around and selling it for a dollar an acre to settlers in order that they get their piece of paper that says, this is their farm. See? And that's a politician's dream, right? You uh, have the post office, the army, and so on. And yet for the first 30 or 40 years of the, of the development of American government, you don't have any taxes on white people, see? Uh, and uh, that's a really important contribution, I suppose you could say that Native people paid in terms of that uh, development. Uh, and also, of course, another thing is uh, the populate, white population is exploding. Uh, Jefferson says that Native women very seldom have more than two or three children because of noxious weeds. That's herbs that are the equivalent of the morning after pill. <laughs> but white women had all of these kids and these kids need a job and most of them the job at that time 200 years or more ago is go west you know a 19 year old boy marries a 16 year old farm girl and they head out from virginia to kentucky see uh, and uh, that's uh, also another important kind of thing that this westward expansion is jobs for white people and that people that have jobs are more politically stable than people that are jobless. <laughs> so all of these politics see uh, play out as a result of relations with native people and the uh, 
uh, you know, kinds of changes that that uh, come about. See, uh, and uh, the, the British depended on taxes on tea and uh, the fur trade, uh, and then the, the Americans uh, turn around and said we can go tax free for a while by you know taking Indian land and then turning around and giving a piece of paper and saying you can have it for a dollar an acre. Uh, so those are important contributions, I think, as well. And then the legal stuff plays out once the economic and political stuff uh, starts going is, is one of the ways that I've always talked about this. Thank you so much for that. Well, we have uh, just a few more minutes, eight to be precise, and we always uh, end on time in, in NCC panels. Uh, 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 so Woody Holden, this may be the last intervention. Um, I'm gonna ask you to tell us more about your really important argument in your recent books that uh, states like uh, Georgia and Virginia moved from having questions about ratification of the constitution to supporting it, uh, partly because of concerns about uh, Native American um, experience. And uh, you even quote the Federalist Papers uh, in reassuring skeptics of the constitution that a strong national government was necessary to fortify states against what they perceived to be um, the uh, challenges posed by uh, Native Americans. So, so tell us more about that and help us bring that story to life as you do so well in your new books. Absolutely. And uh, I, I like to ask students a trivia question. So the first three states to ratify the Constitution are Delaware, Pennsylvania, and New Jersey, all on the banks of the Delaware River. What gets us out of the middle colonies? What's the first other state to ratify the Constitution? And of course, as you suggested, the answer is Georgia. Um, we don't think of Southern states as big, big on the federal government. They certainly aren't gonna be hundred years later, but Georgia, as Greg mentioned, was caught up in a battle, an ongoing battle with the Muscogees, which had large, powerfully influenced Georgia's participation in the revolution. They'd almost kept them out of the revolution because they needed British help. It's now keeping them in or making them very interested in having as uh, Professor Blackhawk mentioned at the very beginning, the Articles of Confederation weren't doing it for people who wanted to take land from Indians. They needed a powerful national government. So that we get Georgia voting unanimously in the legislature to ratify, the, to, to call a ratification convention. And then the ratification convention also voted unanimously to ratify the constitution. And lots of people in Georgia and elsewhere were very clear that they did it because they needed help uh, against the Muscogees. Um, in Virginia, it's a little more complex. There's that, but there's also a more complex factor at work, which is the, the treaty with Britain required that the British leave those forts like Detroit that I mentioned before, uh, but it also required that Virginians and others pay their debts. And so the people, especially in what we call the Valley of Virginia between the Appalachian, between the Blue Ridge and, and um, uh, mountains and the, and the uh, it, uh, the Shenandoah Valley and so forth, I'm forgetting a word there, but the Blue Ridge Mountains and the Allegheny, sorry. Um, people there voted almost unanimously for the constitution at Virginia's ratifying convention and provided the, the margin of victory. And that's because they really wanted the British out of those forts. The constitution would make sure that the British debtors, the creditors got their debts paid back and that would trigger British compliance with their part of the of the. Uh, 1783 treaty, which was that they evacuate Detroit, Niagara, and those other forts. So in very different ways, Georgia and Virginia signed on to the constitution. And we can say this more broadly, and I want to pick up on something that, uh, that Don just said, um, that the federal government was funded by Indian land. We could add tariffs on imported goods, but I think your point is really good, Don, uh, follow the money. We can follow not only the incoming money to the federal government that it made by selling Indian land, but also the outgoing money. And I'll give you a stat that, that'll, that I'll and finish on this, an amazing number that I'm quoting 
um, uh, 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 John Chester Miller's book called The Federalist Era. So the biggest thing that the federal government did once it had its own authority to tax was pay off the war debt. That's a whole different conversation I'd love to have with you. But, the, but of the operating expenditures spent by the federal government during its first six years of operation, say 1790 to 1796, out of the money the federal government spent, five out of every six dollars was spent fighting Native Americans. That coalition that Greg Dowd mentioned north of the Ohio rivers. Follow the money. If you follow the money, as, as, as Don mentioned, you see that that's where the money's coming into the federal government, a lot of it. And if you follow the money going out of the federal government, it's also where the, the federal government is spending its money. And if you follow the money, you come to the same conclusion that Professor Maggie Blackhawk just stressed talking about Indian uh, related um, Supreme Court cases still affecting us now, right up through the modern, uh, the, the, the President Trump's travel ban. You can't understand the mainstream of American history, why the Constitution was adopted. You know, uh, you started us off, Jeff, by giving us the mission statement of the of the Constitution Center. I don't know if other people can see it on their screens, but I can online. The mission statement of the country, one of those provisions is provide for the common defense. Mm -hmm. And the only thing I'm going to do when I come to Philadelphia is a little bit of graffiti, change that to provide for the common offense. Because mm -hmm. follow the money, they spent five out of every six dollars in their first six years of operation fighting indigenous people. Absolutely fascinating. What a, what a superb, what a superb note to end on to, to remind us that that central text in the preamble really was centrally influenced by the uh, by Native American agency, the Native American experience, and the colonial and Western expansion, which, as all of you have helped us understand in your pathbreaking scholarship, was uh, central to American constitutional development. I have to thank you so much. Maggie Blackhawk, Gregory Dowd, Donald Grindy, Woody Holton, for teaching us, for all the light you spread. And friends, thank you for taking an hour in the middle of your day to learn about this crucially important topic. All of us have so much more learning to do. Um, and uh, our, our homework, and I'm going to take it on for myself as well, is to read more of the scholarship and books of our phenomenal panelists who are helping us understand American constitutional history and the Native American experience in a new light. Maggie Blackhawk, Gregory Dowd, Donald Grindy, Woody Holden. On behalf of the Constitution Center, thank you so much and have a great weekend all. Thank you.